pleasure to see most everybody back this morning, I think, which, which speaks a little bit to the, uh, the interest, but I think of the level of engagement and, and level of learning we, we can have today. And I think in a way, uh, the session and our, our, our two speakers and facilitators from Georgia Tech are going to afford us the opportunity to sort of learn from a positive experience where a lot of the things that we talked about yesterday, our desire to scale, um, some of the things that go into scaling programs, this is a group of folks who have really achieved this and in really spectacular fashion. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to, to not only hearing from them and hearing the process they went through to put into action a lot of the things that uh, uh, we talked about yesterday, but I think there's also going to be an ample opportunity to sort of work through a little bit of a, of a worksheet that'll, that'll, that'll sort of give us some signposts along the way. Uh, and obviously to interact a little bit and learn from their experience. So I think without further ado, uh, uh, Nelson and Yakut both have introductions prepared as part of their presentation, so I'm not going to take away from their time. Please let me uh, welcome uh, them both. Well, one here physically, one here virtually. Uh, welcome them to the State University of New York in our workshop and really look forward to working with you today. So Nelson, thank you for being here. Thank you, Todd. Uh, and thanks to all of you. I mean, I, I got in last night, as many of you know, and the conversations that I've been able to partake in just these brief couple of hours, very enriching. Uh, you've got a great group, so, so thank you. And uh, wasn't necessarily the game plan, but it kind of seems appropriate that we're talking about scaling with technology at distances that uh, one of us is here and one of us isn't. Uh, so we might as well use the technologies to make that happen, right? So, a uh, brief introduction uh, about who we are and whatnot. Um, and as you see on the slide here, degrees at scale, as Todd said, this is kind of a piece of the Georgia Tech story, but uh, Yakut, and she'll say more about this in a second, uh, is really the architect uh, around the, this seminar, this workshop. It's something we've done at Georgia Tech for a day and a half each time uh, for universities, because we're firm believers that um, it's going to take a village, all of us, to think a little differently about how we educate individuals across their careers and lifespans. Uh, and that's some of what we want to share with you in the next three hours. Uh, so we realize this is going to be packed, uh, but the answer to this question, what does it take, I'll give you the answer now, so you tell them what you're going to tell them, you didn't, never mind, uh, is you. It's going to take all of us. That's the answer. And we learn as much from these uh, interactions and conversations uh, as I hope you do. So um, brief, brief background. I've been at Georgia Tech now. This is year 31. Uh, faculty member in civil environmental engineering. Uh, I had the fortunate activity that my research areas were in uh, STEM-related education, doing intelligent tutors. My minor uh, was in computer science from CMU. Uh, and one day I was teaching structural mechanics, my background, uh, and light bulbs started going off. Why am I doing these design assistants for designers of, of structures when I could maybe help people learn? Uh, and that just changed and pivoted my whole career uh, over the last 25 years. Uh, and every day I wake up and it's passion space for me, which is a great place to be. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, I am the Secretary General of the International Association of Continuing Engineering Education, so it's a group similar to all of you that talk internationally. And you get the cultural aspects, the nuances of various parts of the globe. Uh, they have the same conversations, the same challenges we do, we just say it differently. And that's one of the great things of being part of that organization. Kim Scalzo here was its president at one point. Uh, she's still the past president. Uh, so you have some great connections into that world. Uh, and in March in Seattle, uh, I'll become president of UPCEA, UPSEA, the University Professional Continuing Ed Association. So Michael and I were just saying here, part of the challenge that we have, I think, in this space is we have these groups of people all talking and great, doing great things. And I'm going to borrow your words, Michael, is, but we don't share those words between groups. So how do we let the rest of the world know what's taking place? And so maybe this is one way to, to try to get at that. 
Yaku. Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank, thank Kim and Alex and the teams to make it possible for me to attend via distance. And um, although we are all technology professionals, we also know that it takes work to make these things like this work. So I appreciate um, allowing me to do this. And happy International Women's Day, everybody. Um, and um, women are continuing to do great things. And I know the leadership of this event there is mainly um, women. So kudos and congratulations. Um, I'm Yakut Ghazi. I have the privilege of uh, working with Nelson um, here at Georgia Tech Professional Education. I lead a team of about um, 35, um, depending on what day it is, 35 to 37 uh, people. Um, we do the learning design, production, assessment, compliance, distance learning technologies, support and planning for uh, Georgia Tech's online endeavors, both on the credit and non-credit side. And, and now, as Nelson mentioned, um, we started telling our story about um, affordable, affordable degrees at scale uh, about two years ago with an event that we started organizing here. And it's a day and a half, and we're going to condense that conversation for you to three hours today. Um, but with that, I would like to extend an invitation to all of you uh, to come and visit us here in Atlanta at the Global Learning Center uh, to see firsthand our story. I will try to give you glimpses of what it is that we do later in the presentation, but there's nothing like being here um, because you know technology is one thing, uh, but we have great talent here that makes all of these things possible. So please come visit us and interact with us firsthand uh, if you get a chance. Um, so Nelson, I will turn it over to you now. Okay, thanks, and please feel free to jump in. Uh, so this is gonna be a little unique for us too, but that's part of what we all learn, right? So we want to do a little bit of background of who is Georgia Tech professional education, not to stand up here and, and, and toot our horn, uh, but at the same token, we think it's been one of the, the caveats or, or secret sauces of why Georgia Tech's been able to do what we've done uh, over the last five years or so. And really, the professional education unit uh, has gone through all kinds of transformations, just like all of your units. We started around 1912 or so as the night school at Georgia Tech. Uh, and all kinds of different organizational changes over the years and whatnot. But we're a centralized part of the university in terms of serving those individuals at, uh, at scale online, uh, as, as well as uh, non-credit conferences. I have a conference center that reports into me. I have a whole campus in Savannah, Georgia that reports into me because it's about workforce. And so when you do economic development, impact uh, reports and whatnot, uh, we, we show that for every dollar we bring in, it probably impacts the economy to the tune of about six. Uh, so it's a six to one ratio. And those are the kinds of things that get legislators uh, interest uh, when we can show those kinds of things. And it's more than just our undergraduate students, the traditional student. Uh, so when you look at these kinds of things, the, the two pie charts that are up here, uh, the, the figure on the left pie chart, the blue represents the credit seeking students at Georgia Tech, the yellow are the students that are non-credit. Uh, in many institutions, you're no different. Uh, those seeking educational experiences are equal to or greater than uh, the other part of the pie. Yet the only things we report as institutions to the federal government and other constituent bodies is the credit seeking individuals. Uh, we're missing half the story, as I tell the chancellor of our system, of the impact of our system to the citizens of our state. Uh, and, and we need to fix that. And largely, those individuals and the programs from which run them are self-supporting, another part of perhaps our governmental system that isn't being told the story of. On the right-hand side is a changing demographic. Five years ago, uh, so Georgia Tech's been doing distance and online for 43 years, uh, so it's not necessarily new, but the way in which we do it is certainly different now uh, in some ways than, than when we started. Um, but we had maybe about 1,000 students uh, out of our 22,000 individuals at Georgia Tech seeking uh, degrees. Uh, as we stand here, or as I stand here in, in front of you right now, we're approaching a third of our credit head count is now online and part-time. What does that mean for an R1 institution? How does it change the ecosystem of our campuses? What's the conversations that we should be having? 
these are the things we want to bring to you today because we're asking ourselves questions now that we would have never dreamt to even think about, let alone ask, of ourselves and of our industry. For example, the computer science program, I'll show you a figure here and coming up, is close to 9,000 individuals. A study from Harvard says that's about 7 to 8 percent of all MS and computer science degrees in the U.S. Is that too big? How do we get diversity of thought in the workplace? Who would have even dreamt that question five years ago? Should we cap it? That's a conversation we're having. When is it too big? Perhaps not that we can't manage it, although we wrestle with that one too, but just because of diversity of thought. So these workshops give us the opportunity to implore you to think perhaps differently, to join in these kinds of endeavors. It's a different marketplace, as we'll show you, uh, that, that we're serving in addition. Uh, the URL at the bottom of the page here is our 2018 impact report. It says some of these kinds of things that I just said if you're looking for information and data uh, in terms of what goes on. So this workshop uh, is going to be compressed. We want to leave as much time as we can humanly leave for Q&A. Uh, certainly feel free to reach out to us post uh, this activity because it's engaging in these conversations that are most important. But there's going to be four parts uh, to this uh, and we'll get into each one. Uh, within each part, we're going to do uh, a presentation, talk about some of the context from the things that we've learned, uh, some of the things we're still learning, uh, some of the questions that we have, and then we're going to have a Q&A session. Uh, that Q&A session, I think, is going to be driven by the online Q&A activities that, that you've used before, so find your mobile devices or laptops or whatever to be able to access that, that uh, location. I'll give you more information in a second. And then as Todd mentioned, there's an action plan document and we'll show you where that is also. Because we want you to take something back with you. So during the session, this is the URL uh, for asking questions. And so Kim has volunteered to help us out by monitoring that and forwarding your questions up to us. Uh, because we know just from past experience, there's gonna be a ton of questions and the challenge is how do we try to combine some things together to answer as much as we can in the short time frame that we have. When you get there, this is session T171. And we'll have this on some of the other slides as well. At the top of this, and I believe also in the center of your table, is that correct, Kim? Uh, is is a uh, action plan example. So these are some of the questions through the workshop that we're going to ask you to think about, uh, take back with you, to think through what are your challenges? Who do you need to engage? How do I start down this journey if I even want to get started? Uh, how scary might this be? Uh, some of those kinds of questions. So we want you to walk away with something that you can possibly use back at your home institution uh, as you leave here today. And, and we'll say more about that as well. So I want to begin with, so does that lay out a structure for what we're going to do today? Everybody comfortable? Each of the sessions are somewhere around 45 minutes. Hopefully we're shooting for uh, half to a little more of that with some prepared remarks and hopefully half, but it's going to be a challenge on our end uh, to try to get to a point where we leave the, t the time for questions in each section. So the first part is some context. Why did we even think this uh, and, and how do we get going? And so. This is largely the Georgia Tech perspective, but this is really our perspective, our being higher ed. And some of the comments that we're going to make here uh, are also come from the information and conversations that we've had at those three summits that, that Yakut talked about. So we believe firmly that higher ed has a challenge in front of us, and we call it the Iron Triangle. And uh, if you've read our Deliberate Innovation Lifetime Education Report that came out last April, we talk about this triangle. Uh, in that as institutions of higher education, we have certainly uh, focused on quality for all the right reasons. Uh, and that should not diminish. So that needs to kind of perhaps lead off this iron triangle. But we also know that there's individuals we don't reach. How can we become more accessible? How can we open the doors to those who don't have access to be able to have access? 
there's still parts of our state, as an example, that do not have internet. I can't fix that necessarily in higher ed, but perhaps I can make a compelling enough case about the economic impacts that education can have on the lives of our people, our citizens, our towns, our economies, that it spurs others to action to put those things in place. But access is critical. Diversity of that access is critical. And if I point a finger back at myself, and again, I'm going to give you one of the answers towards the end, while we've lowered the cost, the last point of this, this triangle, I'm not sure we've improved access. Have we just made education more accessible to those who can afford it than those who can't? Uh, and I'll get into some policy implications around that in a moment. Uh, but this triangle is part of our guiding parameters for why we did what we did. So we started in the MOOC journey uh, back in 2012. And to our faculty's credit, these ideas came from them, not from administration. Uh, and that's one of the secret sauces uh, at our institution. Uh, was students were taking full semester-based courses, because we had some Gates Foundation grants to create them in the MOOC platforms. And they'd say, well, geez, that's the same faculty member that I see in your course catalogs teaching it, uh, in spring term. Uh, and the syllabus is identical. Uh, the assessments look like they're the pretty much the same. Can I count towards my degree? And we say, no. We, why not? Well, we just don't. That's not in credit. That's something else. We don't count that. But it got our faculty thinking, why not? And then when we started to look at how that technology was touching tens of thousands of people, so Georgia Tech's MOOC activities right now have touched more individuals in the five to six years than Georgia Tech has served since it was founded in 1885. That's a staggering thought to think about. Now, as a faculty member, I might step back and, and, and you know, wear my cap and gown and say, well, but they didn't get a degree. They weren't here for four years. No, they weren't. But the whole idea of completion, that 5 to 10 percent that you read about in the media and whatnot, is our definition of completion. They have to finish the course. They have to take the final exam. Individuals who are beyond those in high school that have a bit of street cred under their belt in addition to the knowledge that we might want to impart upon them decide when they're finished. And I think if we accepted their definition of completion, those numbers would be much, much higher. They come to our classes for what they want. They get it. They leave. They don't care about our final exam. Sorry. So what is a degree at scale, and how do we make these things work? We focused in what we call high demand fields. Our governor's office had a career initiative about high demand career fields, uh, and we dovetailed in with that. And so the topics that we've come up with are some of those career fields. Uh, there's other career fields that are out there that are not Georgia Tech's mission space. We've not entered those. For example, we have a huge need in our state for welders. Uh, we don't do welding. Uh, it's just not who we are, but other parts of the system do. So how do we find out ways to improve our economy in, in those kinds of things? How do we improve pathways from non-credit and other kinds of learning activities to open learning pathways? Um, governance and policy are probably the biggest stumbling blocks there, not just local policy, but state and federal policies as well. How do you get financial aid for those kinds of things, for example? How do you even get financial aid for a part-time learner in a master's degree program? Good question. Uh, how do we collaborate with these kinds of platforms? We said MOOC in the slide here, but there's all kinds of platforms and vendors. If you talk to the folks from ASU, the list is just mindless in terms of the number of people they partner with. I they probably have full-time staff and teams of them just to try to manage the relationships. Uh, but there's a lot of great thinking that's going on in this community we need to be listening and learning. How do we innovate around business models? Uh, and you'll hear something about ours uh, in that. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things, business models and policies where I lead. The pedagogy, we figured out. We just need to listen to what science has been telling us for two to three decades around cognitive psychology and put it in action. And then um, online gives us the affordance of, of reaching more people. Uh, and then how do we address that iron triangle? And it's that last part that really is important to us because we think if you don't address at least two of the vertices in the iron triangle, it's not at scale. So this context uh, of what we're seeing in these slides, I'm going to go through very, very quickly because I think everybody in this room has seen some of these things before. That the K-12 system is certainly challenged in many ways. 
Uh, and when you couple that with the changing demographics of what we see coming, one of the things that we did in our report was we looked at 2040 because uh, we thought that was far enough away that it would uncouple us, our thinking from today's current states and context and politics and whatnot sometime in the future, only to find out that individuals born last year would traditionally graduate from Georgia Tech in 2040. Uh, so they're born. We can't change that. They're here. Uh, and, and when we look at those individuals, they look very different from our traditional campus that's on campus right now. How do we change the makeup of our faculty and staff on campus to match the demographics of those who are coming to us? How do we find the deep financial needs that they have? Most will be first gen. Uh, huge, huge differences. As a public institution, our mandate, particularly at the undergraduate level, is to have a majority uh, in-state students. We're concerned there won't be enough in-state students to meet that requirement. So how do we fix that? So if there's fewer individuals in a traditional sense that's coming to our institutions of higher ed, how do we all stay in business? Who's filling the dorm rooms? Who's going to that 8 o'clock class? Not that they go to the 8 o'clock class. There's just not as many people. Yet there's huge needs across the workforce. Some of that will show here in the data. To me, this is about that lifetime aspect. In today's economy, things are happening way too fast. The changing nature of the workplace, the needs that are out there, that we as higher ed should be helping our communities throughout one's career and social interaction with its society, not just the formative years of post high school. You've seen slides like this before. How do we educate school children when 65 percent of them will be in jobs that haven't been created yet? Go back just 15 years and think about all those things that we carry in our purses or clipped to our belts or jacket pockets such as mobile devices didn't exist. So I was talking two weeks ago to a Fortune 100 firm, just did a survey of 50,000 of their global R&D folks. What's the number one or two things that keep you from creating the next new products that our company needs to have to be uh, sustainable in the future? Uh, resounding results. I'm hearing this third hand now because uh, I didn't see the survey or do the survey. Cloud and mobile computing, big data. Didn't exist then. And yet genomics and all those kinds of things are happening with big data and AI. How do they find the next generation of stuff? The number one thing our corporate philanthropy section of the institute says when they talk to companies, they know they can come and get our graduates. They've been our career fairs for decades. They're not stopping that, but how do we help them with their existing workforce? Because they know they need to retool. An example uh, here from, uh, from GM was in the USA Today back in November uh, talking about the shifts that are going on. Technology is changing so fast uh, that if you've been out of school 10 to 20 years, you're not at the leading edge anymore. Well, I argue with that. You're not at the leading edge if you haven't kept up. But how do you keep up? And whose responsibility is it to keep up? Uh, I served on a National Academy of Engineering panel uh, nearly a decade ago, uh, headed up. Uh, from the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, that was the key question. And the answer was, all of us. It's a governmental responsibility, it's a corporate responsibility, it's an individual responsibility. That comes back also in terms of the MOOC completion rates. When they're free, you don't have an invested stake in the game. Life gets challenging, you leave, because other priorities take precedence. So if you have a little bit of stake in the game, so we did one for teacher professional development where the stake in the game wasn't money, it was, before we let you in the program, you have to have a letter from somebody in your school system, principal or otherwise, as to why you want to do it. Now they had accountability because that person was asking them, what are you learning? What do we need to know? They stayed in. I mean, it was an 80% completion rate. Not a money thing, an attitude thing. Tons and tons of reports out here. Here's just a couple talking about these shifts that are taking place. Uh, you have many more in your system uh, as well. And we need to be talking about these kinds of things, sharing them with our constituent stakeholders. Uh, when I say that, I mean parents, I mean community leaders, I mean state leaders, faculty, staff, students, everybody. So if you look at what's happened in the last five years in our, our Master of Science online programs, and for us, OMS, Online Master of Science, is the newer technology. As I said, we've been doing lecture capture and other kinds of, of technology-enabled education for distance for the 40-some years. The last five years, we've purposely have designed it to scale using some of the technologies that we learned for those kinds of things to address the Iron Triangle. 
So as I stand here and I speak, 20,000, almost 800 enrollments this fiscal year. So that's the number of courses people have taken. Those 20,800 enrollments represent uh, close to almost 11,000 students. So when you do the math, you can see that on average they take less than 1.5 classes a term. They're all part-time. Duh, they're working. But it's one-third of our headcount. They're all asking questions of all the offices across our institution, just like anybody else who's trying to learn. But the questions are very different because they have a decade plus worth of work experience under their belt. And they've been through a university environment, so they know which offices are tucked away that might have the answer. And they reach out and they call. And if we haven't touched that office first with what's going on, they say, who are you? What are you doing? And some very interesting conversations start to take place in one's university. When we look at our analytics program, the second one that we launched a year and a half ago, it's now at 2,000 people. So we've gone from zero to 2,000 in three semesters. So think about growth rates in terms of headcount and how do you handle those kinds of things. Uh, when, when you look at those uh, individuals, uh, only about 10% are from the state of Georgia. What's that mean? I thought we were a public institution serving our state. These technologies don't understand geographic boundaries of land masses, just like Amazon doesn't with your bricks and mortar retail stores, just like Airbnb doesn't with your hotel chains, just like Uber or Lyft doesn't with your local taxi. This is a disruption. I'm not sure I like that word, but this is a disruption coming to us. You want to be disrupted or you want to join the game? help build the tracks. Our viewpoint is we want to help build the tracks. Maybe it's our engineering background. I don't know. It's a poor analogy. Uh, but we'd rather be building the tracks, helping to steer where the engine's headed, rather than standing at the station watching the caboose. This is a change that's happening. How do we get on board? Of that first class, 254, we purposely start them small. 37% already had graduate degrees. Across all the degree programs, it's averaging about one in four already have a graduate degree seeking another graduate degree. You look at their applications, they all say the formal education I had was great, but it no longer serves me in the job on which I'm being asked to do. I need something else. One in 25 have doctorate degrees. It's a different market space. Average age is a little over 31 thing that surprises most people as we do these things, majority, vast majority are domestic. It's not international folks. It's people who have jobs, have lives, have families, have a mortgage or rent to pay, car payments. They can't get to any of our campuses Monday to Friday, 8 to 5. And some of your institutions are serving those people in residential modes. But what if they could just study from their phone at lunch and pick up another 10 minutes of the learning exercise. The technology affords them. I look at my kids, um, they're on their phones all the time. I, you know, well, I was talking to my girlfriend. What'd she say? I don't know, I'm waiting for a text back. Well, then you weren't talking. Yes, I was. How many of you have had those kinds of conversations? This is where learning's headed. It's a social interaction as much as it is a delivery of pedagogy. 7% of that first class were VPs or higher at their companies. I need you thinking different markets. So where are we currently? Computer science, as I said, about the 8,500, it's actually 8,842 as of this morning, uh, students. We think steady state's gonna be between nine and 9,500 because now we're graduating enough people from it that it's about equaling out what the incoming folks are looking like. Um, but we've said that before and we were wrong because uh, we thought it was gonna cap out around 7,000 and we're now higher than that. So how high is too high? And that's what's driving this conversation. There's 28 courses available uh, in that program. You need 10 for the degree. Uh, so there's some flexibility in it, but certainly if you were to come to campus, there's a heck of a lot more flexibility. But you can't scale everything, so that's one of the expectation setting features here is what can you expect.
for these kinds of programs and what can't you expect and be clear to the individuals who are taking the programs. There's a value proposition for doing it this way. There's a value proposition to coming residentially. There's a price difference because of that. Um, as we look at these things, the computer science degree program, total program, finished in two years, less than $7,000. It's about 25%. And when we first went to our faculty senate, on to our regents, uh, you can imagine the head spins that we got. Uh, there was no state process, I'd be curious if your state has one, to reduce tuition. There's lots of processes to increase tuition. Is there a process to decrease it? We had to go to a special regents vote to decrease tuition. Kind of says something about the industry in which we were in. OMS Analytics, as I said, started in fall of uh, 18. We're now close to 2,000 students in that. Uh, because of some of the mathematics rigor that we have in that program, we think it'll be a little smaller than the computer science, but it's growing faster than computer science is. So what will our enrollment projections actually look like? And we'll say some about that in the next section. Cybersecurity, we started this semester. So again, we started with about that 250, 243 is where we're at. Uh, there's something different in each of these. So the first one that we did, computer science, was could we do this? This is a harebrained idea, boy, big risk, can we do it? Second one in analytics, can we do it again? Uh, and could we actually scale practicums? So there's a six hour practicum activity in the analytics uh, as opposed to just the course activities. In the third one, there's an online lab. Uh, so there's a cyber lab that students will interface with. Can we scale labs? Uh, so all of these from our perspective is serving market needs, but it's also allowing us to learn something about pedagogy at scale and trying to move our own knowledge about how do we service various things that we do at the university. Um, we know that academic advising is critical. These students have been out for a while. How do we get them back into the study mode? Uh, different kinds of questions. Some of the same questions that you've been wrestling with, I know, as, as a system and some of your institutions. So the question in this report is really who are we serving, what are we teaching, and where are we teaching? And I would like to add in here why. Is it really about what we're teaching or what they're learning? And is it relevant and applicable? Now, I'm the first to say, particularly wearing my faculty hat again, so I put my hat and robe on, we need a broad base of education. It's part of the social ethos that we have to be critical thinkers in a complex economy. But we need to step back and say, well, there's some things people can learn on their own. And just because I went through this sequence of six courses to be able to get the degree program, does everybody have to go through those six sequence of courses? And really stepping back and, and asking the question as to why. And how are we using those technologies? How are we using the social science? How are we using the cognitive sciences, the new, new things that are coming out of all of your work, our work, et cetera, uh, in, in these areas? And as we step back and we see great things happening, like Jill Watson, uh, in terms of AI agent in the class, uh, to help us with, with these kinds of things. Uh, some really, really interesting things. We're doing social experiments now with a computer scientist who's doing AI. I said that. Uh, Asking the students, yeah, there's an AI agent in the class. Would you like your TA to be a human or an AI agent? And seeing what the students answer. Really fascinating to see how other people think about the kinds of assistance that they would like to have in a learning journey. So uh, the URL at the bottom of the page talks about where you can find that report. Uh, if you also just go to the Provost homepage at Georgia Tech, so if you just Google Provost Georgia Tech, it's on the homepage, freely available for download. Uh, we want people to download it. We want people to engage in it. We want feedback. What did we miss? Where are we wrong from your perspectives? Because this needs to be a collective conversation. That gets us to the end of the first session. How do I do on time? Not bad. So here's the website again, session 171. This was about setting context and stage. Obviously, there's a ton more information that could have been shared here. This could have been a whole day and a half unto itself. Uh, it's not, uh, but certainly welcome your questions before we move on. Yakut, anything you wanted to add? No, I mean, I think this was a really good overview. Done very fast. <laughs> 
I kind so, of felt like that TV personality that speaks very fast, but I don't. <laughs> so there are a couple of uh, questions already in the Slido, um, Nelson and Yakut, so I'll um, just share those first couple. Um, the first one is, how many faculty worked on the team oh boy, to create the CSOMS degree, and how long did it take? So yeah, could, I'll just give a brief primer and then you fill in because that's more your area than mine. Uh, so one of the interesting things is we've not added any faculty lines to do these three degree programs. Added a ton of TAs and graders, but no faculty lines. Uh, and we'll say more about that in the budget session. It takes a faculty member, at least in our process, in the order of four to five months uh, to create a course. Uh, Yaku? So um, in the OMSCS program, there are 28 courses, and several of them are going through a refresh right now. So we had about 30 faculty involved uh, throughout the years in those courses. Um, the analytics program has 18 courses to date. Some of those are shared courses with OMSCS. Um, so maybe a dozen faculty members are involved. And then on the cyber side, which we started this semester, we, so far, uh, brand new courses, uh, we have about three faculty members. So what does it make? About 50 faculty members, and these are, uh, as Nelson said, already existing Georgia Tech faculty. They do this as um, overload. This is not a part of teaching load. Um, they are incentivized, obviously. Um, but I think we can say that um, we're, we're working with those who, who do want to do this exceptions exist um, and then we're able to still find people to um, be excited about it. I'd also just echo that the faculty vote when we started OMSCS and yes it went through all the governance processes the faculty vote was not unanimous uh, but some of the naysayers are now teaching in the program. Mm. Not all of them, never get all of them, uh, but some that said no, not for me, are now in the program because they've seen what's happening and who's being touched. Uh, and I think that's a testament to what's going on. The number one source for those TAs are students who have been in the program or finished the program because they all want to be part of the intellectual conversations that's taking place around the curricular materials. You get 11,000 people with a decade plus of work experience. Think about the network. Great. I think part of the part of the question is also how long did it take to create the program, um, and I wasn't at Georgia Tech when OMSCS started, but I think um, folks created about five courses to start with within six months, and then within the first three of the year of the program there were already thirty courses. So it's it's heavy course production activity. We started analytics um, in two two fall semesters ago. And we now have 18 courses. So this is, and there are now courses, enough courses for folks to finish that degree. Um, so we were able to complete the curriculum in, in two years, two and a half years in, in both of these programs. And to the governance part of this, these degrees have all existed. So it's a matter of budget models getting approval and whatnot. Uh, but the cybersecurity programs, we're also trying to drink our own medicine here. Uh, the cybersecurity program we announced to the world, we closed the first class application six weeks later and we built the class with qualified applicants. This is about moving fast also. So uh, there was another um, question um, uh, from uh, about the community college sector. So the um, question is, you know, how does this um, uh, translate to the types of students and the programs that we have at the community college level? I'm going to turn that one back around to you because I don't have experience in the community college sector. I sit at an R1. I have for 30 plus years. Uh, my, my hunch talking to employers and C-suites is that they need a diverse workforce. They don't need just workers from Georgia Tech. They need all of the students that we produce. So I think there's space here for everybody. It's how does it work for you? That's why I said on the very first slide, the solution here is you. Uh, it, it's all of us. So I, I'd be really, really curious about how that might fit because in our state, that sector isn't engaged uh, in our conversation. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. We had lots of conversations, I think, about that yesterday. Yeah. 
I should actually hand this off to Michael Feldstein. He probably would ask a more articulate question. But the <laughs> does the MOOC model assume elite status as well as low costs? And do the 64 college campuses of the SUNY system have the elite status, which seems to be an essential component of MOOCs at scale or, or courses at scale or programs at scale? Um, I'm not sure. I, I know that the Coursera and edX tend to gravitate towards the MITs, the Harvards, the Stanfords of the world, and the Georgia Techs of the world, which is ranked 35th as among national universities with a $2 billion endowment. Um, will that same model apply? I think it's kind of a follow-up to the questions. I, I think it's a great question, but I think if we look at other kinds of ecosystems out here, I'm just going to pick one, Khan Academy. Think what it's doing to students around the topics of math and, and now thinking beyond that. Um, how might we leverage what we see going on around us? And Michael, I see you raising your hand, so please jump in. Yeah, so so I it's in it's interesting your your comments about your students calling around campus looking knowing where to look for information is fa are for fascinating um, and it's let's look at the gap between Khan Academy and uh, and that because I think that's what Peter is getting at right Khan Academy is great for um, getting folks to learn some basic skills right um, and um, uh, what you're talking about is um, really advanced thinking with students who clearly are highly skilled at not just, hey, I, I can move on to the next problem, but I, I now need to problem solve my problem solving. I, it's not just the, the next thing in the playlist, but. I'm stuck, I need to go out, or I, I, I'm curious and I need to go out, and the place to go out is not obvious, right? So there's this whole support structure, which in the, in the community college world is really, really important. You're dealing with students who haven't necessarily learned those skills, mm -hmm. whereas when you've got a, a, a vice president, they've, that, they've mastered those skills. And I don't disagree at all. That's why we show some of those demographics, too. So, so I guess the, 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 the question is, um, you know, do you, in your experience with these courses, do you see opportunities and conversely, do you see gaps in uh, uh, the ability to scaffold in, in this, this kind of course experience for those types of students? Haku, you want to start or you want me to? Why don't you go ahead and I'll, I'll chime in. Okay, so I think scaffolding, at least as I'm interpreting the question, so I could be wrong, takes on several different dimensions. Uh, there's the pedagogical or, or learning scaffolding, and certainly we're trying to build those kinds of things into the courses through the program, looking at program outcomes, just not course outcomes, et cetera. Uh, some of the bigger challenges there is these folks have been out of an academic uh, experience for quite a number of years. How do we get them tuned back up, uh, so to speak, uh, to be back in that study mode, student mode, learning mode? Uh, and they actually do that pretty quickly, our students. Uh, and I think some of that is because they learn on the job quite frequently as well. Um, but then there's other kinds of scaffolding that goes beyond just the learner activities to the student support activities. And so, um, I'm going to make a statement that I don't mean this disparagingly to any of my colleagues at my home institution, but the people that we recruit historically haven't needed those things, and we don't have many of those kinds of services as you would see other places. Uh, we have different kinds of services for what they're, they're seeking uh, because of the student culture and makeup of who it is that we enroll, and I think that's the unique aspect of every institution. You have your own culture and mission space of the individuals you serve. How do you take these conversations to your mission space rather than just try to pick something up from one institution 
and move it uh, lock, stock, and barrel. You've got to understand your local context and who it is that you're serving. Um, so if I can just, and I, I see a few more questions in the, in the Slido area that are more related to how we create content and what the, what the role of instructional designers are and what kind of pedagogy we follow. And we'll try to talk about that in, in the third section of the program. Um, but if I may just add a, a couple of things. Um, one is we approach, um, so content consumption is not education, right? So con student content interaction is just one thing that needs to happen. But then there's content, uh, student faculty interaction and then student student interaction. And I, in, our, in our programs, we try to do everything we can to, to uh, provide enrichment opportunities in all, all these you know, three types of interaction. Um, the other thing we also see is um, if we do not provide those opportunities, our students create those opportunities for themselves. And we will talk about that too in just a little bit. Um, I think the challenge that Georgia Tech has is, uh, as, as Nelson mentioned, one-fourth of our um, students in, the, in these programs already have graduate degrees, which is great. It has a lot of bearing on the quality of the program. Um, but, you know, how do we expand to those who do not have that first graduate degree? Um, how do we also expand to those, I mean, talking about the elites, elite institution, and the elite students that we have been able to historically attract to Georgia Tech. But I mean, can you really scale if you stay within those parameters? So what do we need to do in terms of pedagogy and andragogy, and in terms of you know, preparing students um, coming back from um, being away from school for 10 years, you know, some refreshers, you know, refresher courses and those kinds of opportunities. These are the things that are challenging to Georgia Tech because we have not done these before. But I think those are critical moving forward to our scale programs. But one of the reasons why we're here, because you have, and we need to learn from you. So this is a two-way street. Is there anything else on the? Yeah, I mean, Yakut said there are some questions about the content development. Uh, and there are also some questions about um, advising um, and student services. Do you want to come back to those as well, Yakut, in the later section? Um, I think that might be a better use of your, uh, our time yeah. because I will address those a little bit in the presentation. I don't mind starting talking about those either. If there are other questions related to just the context and the governance and whatnot, maybe we focus on those now. I'm good with whatever works for, for yeah. everybody there. And so um, if there are any other questions in the room, I'm just look, doing a visual look to see. Folks are using the Slido, but if you have questions and you're not using that, anybody else? Just I want to just ask, oh, sorry. Well, I was going to say, just as kind of a context setting, and maybe I should have done this, should have done this at the very beginning, the first section's on context, the second section is the number one question we always get asked, financial models, how do you make $7,000 actually work for you? Uh, and the third section is about teaching and learning, design of courses, and then the fourth is kind of about reflections and what are we still learning? So th those are the four sections today. There's lots of other sections we put in a day and a half, but that's where we focus today. And um, as I'm walking back, I just want to um, emphasize a point that I think um, Yakut and Nelson were both trying to make, which is, um, you know, back to are we, you know, we're not, you know, our community colleges aren't the elite Georgia Tech institution, and yet we have students out there that have needs, right? And so um, are we going to scale everything? No, I think that's what we heard yesterday, right? But in those area, areas where we know there are needs, what do we have to do? How do we figure that out? And I think we're starting to have some of those conversations, and we need all of you to help us think through that. And which one's first? And which one's first? Not infinite budgets. Hi. Um, I, you might answer this in a later section, but I didn't know where it would fit. Um, who owns the intellectual property for your courses? Does Georgia Tech own it, or do the faculty that created it own it? Yeah, that's a great question. We actually talked about this a little bit yesterday. As faculty come into the university, they sign an intellectual property release to uh, the Georgia Tech Research Corporation. So all inventions and whatnot are owned by the university, but there's an IP royalty share that goes back to faculty like at many places. Uh, and so these educational endeavors are no different. And in fact, we use that royalty thing to actually distribute funds back to the faculty in some of these kinds of programs uh, because they're intellectual products. Uh, and so that's our model of how we use it. Now, to that point, if a faculty member goes someplace else, are we going to put
put our foot in the ground and say you can't take it with you, that's not the academy. Uh, everybody takes their course materials with them and we let them as well. They just have to remove the Georgia Tech logo from the slides. Uh, but the fields in which we work are also changing very rapidly so we don't have any concern. But a third point that I would make that I shared yesterday and this is more than just a university perspective or a faculty perspective, it's a student perspective. And so we actually found out about a faculty member leaving our institution, going to another institution for the discussion forums that weren't part of the course, but out in the ether, that a faculty member was leaving. Uh, and the students said, so who's going to teach the class? And we said, well, they're going to teach the class. They're just at a different institution. No, we want somebody that's from Georgia Tech. So there's institutional and student viewpoints here. They're also going to change the landscape of some of these conversations, my viewpoint in the, ro in the years ahead. Can you hear me? So Nelson, there's one more question I think uh, around um, governance that um, might be appropriate now. So yesterday Eva spoke about how critical political and legislative support is. Did Georgia Tech pursue or consider political legislative support? Yes. <laughs> uh, so I was above my pay grade, which is fine by me. Uh, but um, so I said this came from the faculty. Uh, certainly it came from the faculty and then it got to us as administration uh, and whatnot and we uh, listened in good faith. We rolled our sleeves up too and we had two parallel committees at the first one, one in terms of pedagogy, faculty kind of things, and a second one around business modeling and tuition and cost structures and all those other kinds of things, enrollment projections. Uh, and at the end they came together. Uh, if it wasn't for our president, provost, our board of regents, governor's office, um, this wouldn't have happened. So once we got a sense that this was likely to be something we were going to be pushing up the food chain, uh, our president started making trips down to our state capital, uh, which fortunately for us is only about two miles, uh, or unfortunately for us is about two miles. But either, either way, uh, having those conversations, because we didn't want this to blindside, the other phone call we made very quickly was to our regional accreditor, Sachs. Uh, we said, hey, we got this idea, uh, and we think it may have some merit. Would you like to come along for the ride with us and learn? And to Sachs' credit, they were extremely enthusiastic. Uh, it's probably one of the better phone calls that we made in addition to those down at the State House. Uh, but the challenge we had is that after we launched, two years later, we were going through our 10-year reaffirmation. And while the staff of SACS was certainly very supportive, your review team comes from our peers. They knew nothing. Uh, so that's another reason for these kinds of conversations because the Academy is reviewed by ourselves as peers, uh, not necessarily administrators uh, sitting someplace within our ecos. Uh, so the more we can have these conversations and share across all of us as individuals in this industry, uh, the better for all of us. Nelson, part of, part of that is, did you have, you said these programs were already um, approved, programs in terms of G Georgia Tech and with the state education. Um, did you have to seek any further approval for state ed to take it from face to face or weekend or evening? into an online modality? So that was also pre-approved. So we already had an online computer science degree. It was just at regular online distance tuition. So the only approval we needed uh, for these degrees, all three of them, uh, has been the financial side. Uh, that's our next foyer is how do we get one of these that's not already approved in any fashion or do we go someplace in the middle? I think if I may add quickly, um, one thing that Georgia Tech has been doing is um, Georgia Tech has been doing distance learning at a distance for over 40 years. So we already had um, distance learning programs, programs approved for both residential and online. Um, so many people think that online master of science in computer science was Georgia Tech's first, first foray into online which is not, it's just a you know, first foray into affordable degrees at scale. Um, so today we have um, seven what we call traditional distance learning programs, three of these at scale programs and th three professional master's degrees that are hybrid, primarily online, but folks do come to campus. So we had a plen plenty of uh, programs to choose from actually that are already approved for online. And I, it goes back to my earlier comment. 
is that we were fortunate as a university to have some of these kinds of things, uh, not just academic programs, but also ecosystems uh, within our university structure to try to support some of these kinds of things and some experience under our belt. One of the questions I'm often asked, I haven't heard it asked here yet, so I'll just say it, uh, what if we've not done any of these things, where do we start? Uh, and that might be a great place to bring in the conversation about online program managers and those kinds of folks who can bring some expertise uh, to you or partner with another university that has those kinds of expertise. It gets a bit more challenging in terms of dual degrees and those kinds of things through our governance structures. Uh, but that's another avenue to try. Uh, but what, and so this is a personal statement from Nelson. This isn't an institutional statement. What bothers me most is when I go on site visits to institutions and I see them using OPMs. That doesn't bother me. But when I see their institutional strategy is using OPMs forever, bothers me. If this is our institutional mission and strategy to serve students, and this is a new way to serve students, why aren't we creating that capability ourselves so we can guide the direction? Uh, personal statement. Takes some guts to put the programs together, but uh, our biggest thing, and I should have said this earlier too, and I will as we transition into financial models, uh, is we were very, very blessed to be able to have the philanthropic support of AT&T in the first program. So they gave us two gifts, two million dollars each to launch. Because we're a state entity just like you. And that we have to close our budgets at the end of the year and you can't run deficits. Yet until we get to scale, the program's running at a deficit. So where do you find the cash flow to make it work? And the gifts from AT&T made that happen. In cybersecurity, we're now to the point, or just about to the point, where the proceeds from the first two are covering the deficits those first two years of the program launch. And so the more you do, the more you can invest in yourself and get these things off the ground and not have to have those philanthropic supports. But I know when I talk to my provost and to others, the investment capital to launch these kinds of things is one of those critical mission activities. How do you get that started? And that's another role of the OPMs. You pay for that service. Uh, but maybe it's the only way to get there. So with that, let's transition to financial models. I'm also a little mindful of time here. Uh, so I'm going to go very quickly through this too. My apologies. Uh, we're going to try to make some version of these slides available to you uh, post somehow, and we'll, 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 we'll send a link to somebody uh, for, for where you can see some of these kinds of things, because I'll be the first to admit that next set of slides, uh, many of them are eye charts. Uh, as you go through this. So the first thing to realize, uh, again, Nelson's view, is tuition.